I guess good afternoon. My name is Britt Imes. I'm a supervising deputy district attorney and member of the trial team. On behalf of the district attorney's office, we're grateful for the support of the McStay family in seeking justice in this matter. Uh, it was a long, difficult uh, case. Obviously, uh, many of you saw it was very complex. It was also very circumstantial. Regardless of what was said in court today or was said here in front of the media, the record speaks for itself. The evidence speaks for itself. The jury's verdict speaks for itself. No interpretation by myself or by the defense is going to change that. In order to believe a lot of the things that were said in court today, you would have to ignore all of the DNA evidence, all of the financial evidence, all of the cell phone evidence that pointed towards the defendant's guilt. We're glad that the jury saw through that. We're glad that the jury, and we're thankful for the jury doing the diligent and hard tasks that they did. This case went beyond its time estimate by almost two and a half months, yet they stuck through it. And they stuck through it to the end, and I don't think it is appropriate to impugn the credibility of their task, of their work, and the verdict that they rendered. It speaks for itself. Thank you. Why not have run that DNA? Um, I'm going to let Mr. Dougherty address that. He's the most familiar with the DNA evidence. Without getting super technical. Well, I, I'll do my best, but there's never a guarantee there. Uh, <clears throat> what was provided to us in January, early January, uh, were three uh, charts or tables um, that contained numerous alleles. I don't want to get too technical, but all of us only have two alleles at any location. Some of these profiles, as they've been termed uh, by defense counsel, actually contain up to, in one location, 22 alleles. So their own expert came and testified that that represents a mixture of up to 11 people. So the FBI administers the database that we call CODIS. They have very strict guidelines and standards and protocols that are publicly available. Mr. Moline has received a copy of those. He received a copy of those in May. He received a copy of those likely earlier. Um, in order for a government lab to run items into CODIS, there is a protocol that has to be followed. There has to be a memorandum of understanding between the private lab and the government lab. Uh, there has to be a site audit and visit, and then that can be run into CODIS. For, for anyone to say that we didn't try to do that or we didn't inquire as to whether that could be done is straight up false. We tried right when I got it, hey, is this something that we even can run in CODIS? And the answer was no. Uh, so STR mix and uh, true allele are really meant to deconvolute mixtures of people, not to create profiles that could be later put into CODIS. So uh, the regulations were not met. I've actually spoken to labs that used the software that was, they, they've purchased it and they used it here and they said we could not run this into CODIS because it requires steps ahead of time. He knows that. He's doing this for this. That's why he's doing this, is these cameras. To make it seem like the district attorney's hiding biological evidence, that is not true. Or not not running through those. You, you could run it into the, through the lab because you didn't have a memorandum of understanding? There, there are, I'm not gonna cite the, the, the word for word, right. but in order to accept data for input into CODIS, there has to be prior approval from the government lab that's going to run that into, in CODIS. And in order to get prior approval, there has to be a memorandum of understanding with the private lab and with the, um, between the private lab and the government lab. So why not get that memorandum of understanding? I mean, is, that, is there more to it than a document? I think I said a couple times, site audits, visits, the technical director has to go through everything. Last, so. last in the weeds DNA yeah. question. Was this a pro, were these profiles or not? Okay, these were profiles in terms of a, in terms of how probabilistic genotyping software looks at profiles, okay? When shown to Susanna Ryan, which was the defense's own expert, and I said, how many people does this represent? She said, this could be a mixture of up to 11 people because there's 22 alleles, two per person, okay? There were You look like you have another question. Good question. I don't have an answer for it. Summer's DNA was not found on her own bra, either cup. Um, the 
was the fact that Joseph McStay was wrapped in this cord. It was literally sticking in his body, and his DNA was not found. He was excluded as any donor for that DNA. Um, so, I mean, I can get into the weeds technically, but... My, my question is more, let's talk about what, what do you guys feel were, was the strongest evidence that you had against Mr. I'll probably let I'll probably let Britt or Melissa talk about that. Uh, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to briefly comment that the cell phone evidence, the video evidence, are definitely convincing. But I have to credit Ms. Rodriguez for the work that she put in on the financial side, and I'll have her explain why that was actually even more important. Well, the financial evidence, we believe, provided the motive for the actual murders in this case. Uh, there was a lot of evidence that detailed the QuickBook records in the business um, to show that the defendant had actually been taking money from the business and writing checks to himself and deleting those checks, calling into QuickBooks and canceling the subscription for QuickBooks after the fact, um, as well as an email that was discovered um, within the computer of the McStay family home detailing that the defendant owed uh, Joseph McStay somewhere in the neighborhood of $42,000. So what we believe happened was that there was some recognition by Joseph McStay that somebody had accessed his bank account and printed up those checks, and we believe that there was some sort of a confrontation about it that happened on February 4th. So the financial motive was extremely strong, especially when you look over the history of the defendant's bank records. You see uh, huge, huge amounts of money taken out at casinos, um, well over $25,000 in a nine-month period, and then there's a period of no bank activity followed by a brand new account opened in February of 2010 with a handwritten check from Joseph McStay. Same day another check was, um, or on the 4th there was another check that was deposited, I'm sorry, February 1st was another check that was deposited after a vendor was added into QuickBooks and that vendor was Charles Merritt. So are you essentially saying that you believe that, that, that Mr. Merritt was dipping into the funds, got caught, had a confrontation, and that's when this happened? Yes, ma'am. Are you saying that it happened in the home in Fallbrook, or, or how, what's the theory on that? I can't give you the details on that. Um, unfortunately, because it started out as a missing persons case, um, and there was a long period of time before the family disappeared, and um, when they were actually reported missing, it's approximately 11 days, I believe. Um, we're not able to tell you exactly where the crime occurred. Are there any other questions? Yeah. We're going to, oh, uh, Go Mr. Moline has, has suggested not these exact words, but that you guys would have trouble sleeping tonight over this conviction. What do you say to that? I guess, first, the repeated accusations of defense counsel disparaging our integrity, our ethics, and even the jury's integrity are completely unwarranted. His characterization of exculpatory evidence is unfounded. Otherwise, how would they have been able to call that witness? He fails to mention to you that I disclosed that stuff to him in a timely fashion, thus the reason they knew it. So to stand up here and say that the people hid and destroyed and lied is unfounded. But ultimately, our job is to seek justice where the facts lead us. Our job is not to seek a win, as they like to put it. Our job is vested in the hands of the jurors once we present our case. They make the ultimate decision. I think those jurors will sleep just fine tonight based on the evidence that they were presented.